And uh, just going to give you a really brief a slideshow to kind of put you back into those days, if it's possible. And then the panelists are going to take you really back in a time machine. And when I think about the events that we've done the last few years, from the Alto event on up to the homebrew event and whatnot, what emerges is this kind of soup, this kind of milieu of what was going on in the mid-70s. And I was a nerd kid in the mid-70s. I actually went to Sunnyvale. On a, I'm from Canada, if you can't tell. You might have thought I was Minnesotan, but no. <laughs> I'm from the great pink north. Uh, the, um, so we came down. I was in, in the spring of 75, staying in, in, uh, Coop, in Cupertino, actually in Sunnyvale, but I didn't know anything of this was going on around me. But I kind of picked up on the, the vibe that was in the Bay Area in the mid-70s. And I said to myself when I was a 13-year-old kid, you know, not much older than a couple of you guys there, that I wanted to come back and live here. And that's how I ended up coming back and li living here. And so um, I kind of had a sense for that. But of course, any of us who were in school and whatnot in that period, and we started, even if we were in the hinterlands like me, you got the personal computers eventually. Eventually, it came and trickled down to you. But um, we're just going to, I'm just going to give you an idea of this soup. And I think of it as a kind of a baking exercise. We'll go to the next slide. So you want to cook up an industry? It's easy. Just follow this convenient recipe. First, it's George, the, the, ingredient, the ingredients. You've got good ingredients, ingredients. And uh, well, what do we have in, in this? Oh, lights. Chris, are you there? Can you shove the lights down? Oh, there we go. There we go. Ah, beautiful. Easier to see. So, ingredients. What do you need to cook up an incredible gourmet dish to create an industry? Well, you need extraordinary people. Too many people to, uh, to list that were involved in this industry, of course, but some of the people we have here today uh, were some of those extraordinary people. Uh, you need inspiring places. Well, ho uh, Homestead High in the lower left. That's Homestead High in 1974, <laughs> folks. Without all the fancy media centers that it has now, but maybe it had the big swimming pool. And extraordinary places, Hewlett Packard, there's HP 35. Extraordinary machine, extraordinary people, extraordinary place. Atari, we all know what an impact that had. It was kind of in a way a bridge from the big company like HP into the, into the world of, of, of people using computers. And uh, there's another extraordinary place, that's the garage in Los Altos, that's the Jobs Family Garage. Extraordinary place. And you had deeply felt nerdly passions. There's a, a, a little screenshot of Lee Felsenstein last year waving his yardstick as at the uh, homebrew club. Uh, and you had down there, this is an excerpt from Rich Today's uh, Finite State Fantasies. It's the cartoon about a kid who's building his homebrew kit. So late at night, uh, with his, everyone shut out of the room. Anyway, so that's, that's uh, ingredients. Next slide. You need recipes. Well, uh, one of the great early recipes was build a TV typewriter by Don Lancaster. I know Waz will be able to explain about this, and I think Daniel will be able to comment a little bit about, gee, what happens when you combine the TV typewriter recipe with the Altair recipe? What comes out of that? So these are excerpts from Homebrew Computer Club newsletters that we collected last year. And you can see uh, this is uh, the first note is, I think, from the second newsletter or third. And Waz is building a TV typewriter of his own design. In the, that was a comment from uh, was at that meeting. Randy Wigginton is uh, trying to get an Altair 8800 to play games. I don't know if that happened. Um, anyway, so recipes, you got to have them. And, and they were floating around. Next slide. Kitchens, when we talk about the garages, there are very few pictures I could find of sort of inside garages, but I found uh, this out from a Fortune magazine article. There's Steve Jobs standing in front of the garage, and that's sometime in the 80s. And then this is supposedly a picture inside the garage in 76. Uh, I don't really know what that, that shows. It's sort of stuff stuck on the wall. Um, this is purportedly a picture of uh, Waz's workbench in 76. And maybe you can verify if that's a, a reconstruction or is it the real thing. Uh, anyway, that's that, there we have it. Uh, next picture. And you, of course, have to have chefs if you're going to make a, a fine dish. And here's the various collection of pictures of our chefs then and now. And I think the one that 
it's sort of most endearing, I think, is the number 26 there with Waz, uh, with the actual blue box, and it is colored blue, in fact. So it must, be, it must have been the blue box. And uh, if you see the one in the lower center, that's, uh, that's at the West Coast Computer Fair. Uh, and there's a whole series of pictures t taken by Tom Munnicky, who, who sent them to me. Uh, anyway, and then up in the upper right there, there's Steve Jobs this year uh, doing a, a commemoration of the 30th event at, at, at Macworld in the spring. So, and I think that this one in the upper left is uh, Steve Jobs looking at a blue box. It's always purported to be that on, I think it's, that was from Waz.org. Anyway, uh, just a great collection of then and now of the chefs. So next slide. And cooking it up. Very few of these around. It took me a long time to find on the net an actual Apple One schematic, but there it is. Uh, it was from an article many years ago, and there's some of Waz's notes there. I think it's a 6502 floating point ad sub mole and div. Uh, little handwritten notes there from uh, March 676. So maybe that was something for the homebrew club. I don't, don't know in particular, maybe just your own notes. Oh, the whole manual is, oh, the manual right there, so we could actually, could actually figure it out. Oh, these are the 6502 routines that was handed out at Homebrew. For doing floating point. Ah, here we are. Okay, so. Sorry, I forgot my white gloves. <laughs> so. Okay. <laughs> we are in the museum. <laughs> so here, here's the whole schematic, the whole scoop. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, Liza. Uh, next slide. And hot out of the oven. Apple One, this is a photo from Salam uh, from about four or five years ago. And you said there was a bent pin on it. You could tell if it was, that came from you. I think you just. Well, no, it's actually a and, and I'm always curious as to why it says Apple, uh, Apple Computer One, Palo Alto, California. Did Palo Alto have much to do with it? I'm not sure. It's sort of the neighboring community? Mailing address. Mailing address. Oh. Yeah. Answering service was there. Okay, there we go, solved. Uh, next slide. And then the gorgeous <laughs> one everybody knows, the Smithsonian one, and I know I read somewhere how that someone's dad made this case lovingly. Uh, no? Okay, we'll hear about that on the panel. That, that's a good question for the panel. Where did this gorgeous case come from? Uh, next slide. And here's uh, out of the oven, here's Apple One running. And I believe it's just, you're doing a dump of the addresses, right? You're getting a, a dump of the memory. And then, uh, is that a program that's running to output the whole character set, I think? Yep, yes it is. Okay. So he was just reading the, reading the hex there and compi reverse compiling on the fly. Impressive. Okay, uh, next slide. And this, as I spoke about earlier at the uh, first, uh, the serving of the Apple, the first public show, and there's Daniel Kotke and Steve Jobs in Atlanta City, New Jersey on August 28, 1976. And you can just sort of see a little computer in the right on that, that's a um, little placard there, and perhaps that's a marking literature or tech spec behind them. Uh, but that's a great, great photo there. And of course, I'm wearing that T-shirt there. And the, uh, uh, the great Apple computer logo, which I'm sure the panelists will explain where that comes from. So it's such a beautiful piece of art. And next slide. And uh, what's interesting about this, although the, the projector's munging this a little bit, is when you look at this first literature, this first sort of spec sheet or ad for the Apple One, it really looks like an Apple ad of today. It's got that Times Roman font on the top and very clear explanations and you know, it's just, it, it seems like it's, an, it's Apple. Apple's had that consistency all these 30 years. And price is $666.66, and I'm sure the guys will explain, that, is this indeed the mark of the beast? <laughs> Which I don't think it was. I think it was just repeating, repeating numbers were easier to remember. Anyway, uh, next slide. So our, we've kind of blown our schedule here, but we're basically going to let the panelists sit up. We're going to 
when we finish this, turn, on the, turn off the projector, let the panel sit up here and just start to talk. And after a certain amount of time, what well, seems to make sense, we'll open it up for a story period. If anyone has a story, keep it under two minutes to blurt out. I know Crunch has a story, um, which will probably be under two minutes, um, but he will blurt that out and for all to, uh, to enjoy. And we'll do some kind of mapping or random access. So if anybody else could stand up, this is Lee Felsenstein homebrew club term, to say anything that you want to connect with other people, say around the Apple history. And we're really looking for people who have pictures and video and, well, not maybe a little bit less video, but anything that we can scan in for artifacts for our pages to offer to the world under our Creative Commons license uh, about Apple's early history. There isn't a whole lot on the web and there needs to be more. There's some excellent books about it, but there needs to be more artifacts. And if you have photo albums of slides or whatever, or pictures of things at Apple in 76, 77, or anything, I, you know, there's a bunch of us that want to scan those in. If you're okay, them being offered for non-commercial use uh, off the DigiBarn pages. It's, 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 this is why I do these events, to gather more cyber archives. We're gonna do the lovely cape cutting. People will mill about and general confusion will prevail um, Al Lindell and Daniel will be sequestering some people for interviews. And at 9 p.m., Waz will finally finish talking to people and signing their IWAS books and Apple II covers. <laughs> That's what happened last year. Now, I think Waz is feeling a little under the weather, so he may be uh, leaving before 9 p.m. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll let him be the best judge of that. So next slide. So there's the cake cutting from last year, and it's up here, and you'll, you'll all get your sugar highs from this. That was the homebrew cake. This year we have uh, Apple at 30, this logo on the cake. Uh, great cake, thank you, Safeway. And it might be the last slide, but keep going. Uh, thanks too. And um, all these people here, all these magazines that we took pictures and covers from, uh, people who've helped, the speakers, etc., and also the Jeff Raskin, who many of you knew. This is uh, one of the last pictures that I took of Jeff, and one of the last things that he did to benefit me is to show him the Apple one that Steve Wozniak gave him. And uh, it's sitting right up here. Thank you, Linda. Next pick, next one. Oh, uh, don't forget the shameless plug. Uh, <laughs> Digibarn Computer Museum. We're up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Nerd buys farm eight years ago. Nerd walking around farm notices there's a 5,000 square foot barn there. They didn't notice before. What does nerd do with barn? Wife loves pigs, so pigs go, potbelly pigs go in the outside horse stalls. Nerd walking around on the inside of barn says, I could store old computer junk in here. <laughs> Hence the beginning of, and I happen to have a Felton Parent comptometer from 1990, 1922, which will look really good sitting right there, beginning of Digibarn. <laughs> Nerd goes over to Xerox Park for last demo of Xerox Star and says, this can't be the last demo of a Xerox star. Nerd finds all old Xerox hardware to assemble and get working to continue the Xerox story and then discovers you gotta tell everything else too. So there's now about 400, 450 systems there, crazy supercomputers down to little itty bitty things. And uh, it's all a community-based project. It's, uh, it's mostly they sort of work if you're lucky kind of thing, but you can boot up the artifacts the whole DigiBarn is meant as, an, as a story capture mechanism. The main focus I have is getting your stories onto the site for perpetuity. Because when the people are gone, the artifacts will still be well preserved somewhere and the people won't be there to tell the stories. So that's what I'm, I'm mainly focused on. And uh, so anyway, visit digibarn.com. Three o'clock tomorrow down in the lobby, I'll hand out maps and we'll lead the group over to the museum. If you wanna stay after about six o'clock, uh, we'll go out and have a, a brew at the brewery. The Boulder Creek Brewery, a very fine brewery. And uh, I think that's, and uh, now we're, we're segueing into really when we're here, and our panelists. And my wife, Gail, and Tiffany, took me outside the head last year. She said, you're gonna do this and my husband said, I'll leave people on. I don't know anything else. She said, feel free to retile. So I promised her, I will retile. I won't read uh, my file, but it's a long file, but what we the wonderful have here today is the short files of Steve Wozniak. Well, Steve's the boss. But I, I, I should really tell you a little bit more about him. Steve Wozniak is a Silicon Valley icon and philanthropist for the past three decades. He 
what saved you, what, what kept you going was people, technology, diffusion of cash flow. When Apple was just sort of this fragile entity, what, what, what kept Apple in the scope? And uh, kind of looking back, how do you think of the industry today and the innovation people can do today? Are there garages left? Do people still do the garage thing? Is it still possible to do something in your garage? Maybe in your Ajax browser is your garage, your Ajax code base. Uh, are we still, is the garage still the source of innovation that it was? And uh, with that, I think let's drag some chairs over. We'll